And then, yeah. of course, you can't write a book with a title like that and get away with it. So there, were, every woman who lives nearby me who knows about it was, you know, have you been running today, you fat bitch? <laughs> and I, yeah. <laughs> I really had to, you know, I had to live live by it. Welcome to the Seven Day Soul TV and the A Tweak A Week podcast. If you are someone who wants to reach your full potential, who feels like you have more to give, who doesn't want to let your short time here slip through your fingers, then you finally found your tribe. I'm your host, psychologist and author Susanna Healy, and on this show, we'll be talking with expert researchers about all things psyche and soul so that you can achieve your full potential and live a life without regrets. To reach the better angels of our nature, we know the devil's in the detail of what we do repeatedly. So we be talking habits, existential health, bucket lists, meaning, mattering, sleep, self-actualization, responsibility, discipline, faith, procrastination, gratitude, goal setting, sex, focus, careers, and loads more. Let's inject the everyday with a passion for your potential. But before we start, just a reminder, if you like the show, then don't forget to subscribe. You can also get your free 100 tips for daily progress by visiting the 7 daysoulcom homepage. Or if your workplace is all about human potential and you'd like to sponsor the show, then reach out to join us. Details are in the show notes. Hello and welcome back, everybody, to episode six of the A Tweak A Week video podcast. Uh, I'm Susanna Healy. Great to have you all back with me and welcome to any new visitors that are visiting us today. Um, you're in for a treat today. We have the grit doctor with us, uh, Ruth Field, uh, author of Run Fat Bitch Run, also Get Your Shit Together and 20 Reasons to Run uh, with another book coming out soon. And we'll hear about that in a little while. So if you're lacking in motivation, this is the person you need to speak to and listen to. Um, also, her books will just make you, I have to say, they make me laugh out loud, which is kind of embarrassing sometimes, I have to say, in all the wrong places. Um, but it's um, just really, uh, this woman who kind of eats procrastination for breakfast. So she will really get you going and just challenge you on all of those excuses that we make. And there's, ah, oh, yeah, but oh, my situation's different. Or, ah, oh, yeah, tomorrow or New Year's Day. That's when I'm going to start. No, start now. Start now. Start this afternoon. Start whenever you're uh, reading or listening to this podcast. So it is really about getting going where you stand right now with all the mess that, that is around us. So um, really a woman as I say, that kind of, you know, you know, is all about fighting that procrastination tendency in us and really where there's excess adipose, excess sofa sitting, excess excuses, whatever it might be, she will sort it out for you. Welcome, Ruth. Thank you, Susanna, for that lovely introduction. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's true. I really think it's true. <laughs> Even after just kind of rereading your books, they can, oh, yeah, you know, because sometimes you, we get into these zones of motivation, don't we? And then we kind of lose them again. It, it is something, motivation is something that we need to kind of work on ongoingly, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I sometimes feel a bit um, guilty about um, how I wrote Run, Fat, Bitch, Run before I became a mother. And uh, <laughs> when, of course, everything seemed a lot more <laughs> straightforward and I was very sort of hold on a second why is why are people complaining about not being able to do this because actually you know just do it kind of thing and it was ironic I, 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 ironic is probably the wrong word but I when I had twins the book hadn't yet come out it was in the sort of being sold stage and I and I was completely um stuck on the sofa with the twins thinking there's, I'll never be able to run again. I'm so tired. Uh, and all the excuses that yeah. I'd written in the book, suddenly I was using myself. But I think it was because I'd written the book and maybe because I'm a Catholic, which I'm sure we'll come to, I felt so guilty that I'd written this book that was ordering everyone around and I wasn't doing it myself anymore. And I just had to, I had to, you know, get myself up and get running because I'd written a book that was going to come out. <laughs> and um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. and so in a weird, weird way, the book became sort of, it sort of set, it got me back into running, my own book. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, yeah. of course, you can't write a book with a title like that and get away with it. So there were, every woman who lives nearby me who knows about it was, you know, have you been running today, you fat bitch? <laughs> <laughs> and I, yeah. <laughs> I really had to, you know, I had to live live by it. And 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 I'm so glad that I did because I still run pretty much every day, and I've yeah. run with lots of women 
locally and still do I, I mainly run with a friend I have two friends that I run with diff- on different days because I find that being together with someone else is hugely motivating you know if you've made a plan yeah. to meet we put we meet at like 7 a.m you know to run before yeah. work you, you're much less likely to duck out of it if you've made that plan because I don't take my phone with me so you know we, we we trust each other that we've made that commitment we meet at the gates to the wood and we we go on that run so so yeah, yeah. I mean I do understand the procrastination and the wanting to sit on the sofa but ultimately even with the twins it, it was it was a case of you know putting one foot in front of the other and just just doing it um yeah and and it kind of is isn't it because i i do kind of relate to that my my own first book was fabulous jelly use your brain to lose weight and it was based on my own weight loss journey i've kind of struggled with my weight all my life really and it was about when i finally came around to using some techniques and some very simple things <laughs> Sometimes I feel like I could actually just abbreviate into run and lower the carbs. <laughs> to be honest. But, you know, but we can get to that, you know, but, you know, but it was all about the psychology because I do think most of us know, yeah, we know it's good for us. We know that diet's good for us and this is good for us and that's bad for us. And all. We know the basics. You probably, you don't need to be a dietitian to know generally speaking what's good and bad for us. It's all around the motivation question mm. and even I, I I mean I do remember but afterwards I remember actually kind of like struggling again and then trying to st- you know starting up again that motivation do you think it kind of does it come and go for you do you think or is it or do you feel no. like it's it's a muscle that you learn it's such a good question I think if there was a sort of definitive answer to it um we, we'd solve mm. <laughs> so many of, the, of of all of our exercise weight um procrastination issues there isn't a straight answer but what I found as I've gotten older is that I see motivation almost a little bit more as a chore as a choice in the sense that I'm not sure that I feel motivated first so Mm -hmm. by that I mean what I know because it's a I know from habit and from how a day looks I know that if I do get up and meet my friend for that run at 7am. Okay, I'm never motivated to do it. But what I know is that if I do do it, that everything else in my day will be easier. And the motivation for everything else in my day will probably be there because I've been running. So the run Mm -hmm. sort of the run is actually the motivation for me. Like once I've run, I, I can get everything else done. But whether that's psychosomatic, you know, what, but I, what I do know is that I'm never really that motivated to do it. I just choose to do it because it will make my everything else easier. And Mm. I find that the eating thing is so connected to the running. So if I run, I know I'll be hungry, but somehow my food choices are always better because I've run. Like yeah. I feel happy. I, it's because I feel happier. I feel calmer. I feel more myself. I feel, you know, wanting to put good stuff into my body. Um, I'm energized, but calm. It's all of that stuff. So for me, the motivation is 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 almost comes as a result of the exercise. But how to get motivated to do the exercise? I think for me is literally the night before making that commitment with a friend, and I know we're going to do it. I, d- I just wouldn't not I wouldn't just not turn up yeah yeah that that's interesting so there's a couple of things in there and um you know I came across a paper only this morning and it was uh, if we have uh, this whole mindset thing it's kind of like you know you were saying there about you make the first choices to go running and then the motivation comes which is uh, you know not to wait for the motivation I think is what you're saying isn't it just to yeah make it a choice of doing yeah, don't because I think right. we think of motivation as a sort of feeling that we're going to get. Yeah. I don't think motivation works that way. I think motivation comes from once you've started on some kind of action. It doesn't have to be running. For me, it's running, but it could be anything for anyone. Yeah. It's like the motivation comes after you've started doing the thing, I think. Yeah. I don't think it's there first. Yes. Is it? It yeah. isn't for me. I don't. I never expect or hope for sort of motivation to 
come my way. I just think, right, Ruth, you know, get running or, or I don't even actually think that. I just I just do it because yeah. I feel everything else is easier to make, make motivate myself to do is easier because I've been on that on that run. Yeah. Yeah. The, this paper was saying, we, uh, you know, we kind of would back that up as well. It was, but it was interesting. It was saying that if we have this sense of a fuel tank and if you worked really hard and if you have a, a kind of a limited sense of kind of the capacity of you have a certain limited capacity in terms of your energy, um, then you will actually say, well, I've been working really hard. So it's perfectly understandable that I'm tired now and I want to put my feet up. Whereas if you think of it the way you do as actually an energy that work or running and exercise are all energizing that they actually create that movement creates energy which yeah. is a much more kind of you know Expand. self-fueling kind of attitude then yeah. actually you'll feel like oh no I'm really you know I'm in the in the zone I'm going to keep going now you know yes absolutely but you know within that there's also a, there's often a time in the afternoon where I'm exhausted <laughs> but yeah you know so I'm all for having a nap or yeah. you know reading a book and but 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 I just feel I'm much more eff effective and efficient um if I've been on my run and I definitely don't wait to feel motivated but look you know Susanna yeah. like everyone I have days when I'm in a slump and I can't be yeah. bothered I, it's ju I'm just the same yeah. as everyone else I feel like yeah. a lot of us are looking at other people thinking wow she's so much more kind of you know motivated or getting so much yeah. more done and I think that's you know a fallacy of modern life and also because of all of social media and how we see people's lives but but also it, it is in and of itself incredibly demotivating there's nothing worse than looking at other people thinking wow how are they so motivated for everything well I would say they're probably not they're probably just doing it <laughs> and then hoping that you know yeah. knowing that the motivation it's, they're, they're not thinking about motivation. A bit like writer's block. You know, if you're a writer, you just write. Mm -hmm. You know, you just you, you, you sometimes it's not very good writing, or sometimes it's mm -hmm. really hard, but you still do it. You don't sort of think, oh, yeah. I've got writer's block today. Well, that's bad luck. I'm, that's a bit like saying I'm not motivated. Yeah, yeah. For me. You, know, it, 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 you, you open... Um, Run, fat bitch, run with the kind of what you call the pointless pledge. Do I? <laughs> I can't remember. I don't even remember back to this. I know, I know the feeling. When somebody takes a comment in your book, you're kind of going, "That was a long time ago." I wrote that. I know, I know, I know. But I have, to, I had to laugh because it said um, part of it was, "I swear on my mother's life," and it went on. And I was, I, I don't know if you, if you have in the UK, but my, my kids are going through this phase at the moment. Oh, it's a, if they want to kind of like make sure that somebody's telling the truth, they'll say, go mums on it. And that means go and swear on, on your mother's life. <laughs> so I hear my boys kind of saying mums on it, mum. And you're kind of going, is this a compliment in a way? Because the idea behind it is that you would never lie and swear on your mother's life and break it. On the other hand, you're kind of going, mm, it's a bit well, the other hand, they're sure. actually lying a lot. And not, yeah. <laughs> and not caring about their mother's life. That's what I would exactly. work Exactly. I'm kind of going, do I get a say in this a little bit? But I have to say, I thought it was funny. One thing that I also noticed is that, you know, I'm just looking at the cover of your book. And there might be, this may be a very old copy of it. I don't know. But it's a great, oh. I just love this. I think it's a great cover. Um, but, you know, very female. And so was mine, very female. And I'm just wondering, what do you think about that? Is it, do you think, uh, you know, is it something, are we, is it women are harder on themselves? Do we need more drive? Is there a male, female difference? Or do men have an inner bitch at, that we kind of, you yeah. call on to? Do you yeah. see a difference? Yes. I mean, I actually wrote the book um, for really, it started off as a book for my husband. So it wasn't designed to be for women. It was to try and get him to exercise and actually when it got bought um uh the editor said that she thought that the voice was actually very is very male almost like a sort of military ser sergeant you know the grit dr sam <laughs> yeah it's quite a sort of very well that's what um i was told and, and i feel that that there is something in that it's sort of it's not at all feminine in 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 mm -hmm. for want of a better word but, um, you know, I am a woman and 
it was it was it turned out to be a really helpful thing for women but it it didn't come from that place it was very much for a man and I feel like the voice of the grip doctor is strangely quite male it, it's my sort of really yeah um no nonsense sort of straight talking sergeant major kind of sergeant major thing. which is not the sort of voice yeah. that women use enough either you know i mean maybe that was the maybe that was what was appealing about it was that it was a bit different yeah. because it wasn't um it wasn't wrapping anything up in cotton wool it was it was quite direct and tough mm -hmm. talking so i mean i've had loads of male readers of run fat bitch run who loved it just as much um so yeah. i think it could have been if it had a blue cover <laughs> maybe it could be resold yeah. um run fat bastard run um yeah <laughs> i don't feel that any of the advice would i do think that men have their own inner in a bitch and i think it's it's kind of quite gender neutral in that way it's just the way it was it was packaged mm -hmm. um yeah but i think men are much less hard on themselves that mm -hmm. i do think but maybe that's just because i'm a woman and i don't see it but i feel we're more self-critical and self-doubting and more likely to sort of you know chastise ourselves and think we've not done as good yeah. a job whereas I feel yeah. that guys are just a bit better at saying, no, I, you know, I did a great job when maybe it was quite average. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you're right. And even in terms of, I mean, they, it looks at the, uh, even in terms of studies that show about, you know, men who are much more likely to apply for the job that they don't actually tick all the boxes for in yeah. terms of, you know, demands or qualifications needed, whereas a woman will hesitate. So I, I, I think you're probably right in that. And I know that I was told when I come to, oh, I want a more gender neutral co cover, they were kind of going, well, you know, men don't buy these books but they read the women's books you know so an interesting point you know they don't buy them but they will read them ah. um so I, you know i thought that was interesting do you think oh. we have become too have we become too soft do we you know I, I, there's so much talk about kind of listen to your heart and all of that kind of thing and just be true you is that softness is it over softness or do we need to get a little bit of harshness into our lives have we become too <laughs> um, easy going on ourselves i do i don't know i i'm not sure that we are easy going on ourselves i feel i feel like you know things have just got harder in a way for women and for young girls particularly with social media i mean it's just all so intimidating um in terms mm. of the sort of constant comparisons with one another and um you know the world becoming very sort of ego you know it's all about what do I look like and so I don't know whether it's like we've become too soft but maybe we've become very self-obsessed I, I, I which 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 is definitely I'm sure not a good thing just because I think it makes everyone unhappy I think when we think too much about ourselves and particularly what maybe we look like or how we look in comparison to other people and I don't just mean like our faces and bodies but our lives our children our homes all of that kind of constant comparison I don't mm. know if that's soft that's it's not a softness it's just a I don't think it makes us feel good about ourselves I don't think it makes us feel yeah. happy you know the the for me the best way to feel better other than going for a run is to sort of you know do something that isn't about thinking about oh how am I feeling or how do I look or you know that just kind of yeah. grinds me down if I if I think about that too much I'm just bound to get yeah. you know depressed because you're always going to find you know you're older and fatter and, <laughs> and uglier than you want to be or whatever it is <laughs> but you know none of that is important none of that is important but I think it does I think that there's too much I think that there is too much of that and I think it does you know make people sad yeah yeah so it's a matter of kind of you know running or as and you mentioned it doesn't have to be running it was running for no. you but it, it might be something else but that kind of idea of turning the spotlight outside Out. of ourselves with yeah, I, I think outwards so. as opposed to introspection yeah yeah I think so yeah. I, I feel I think so like I think introspection is is good in some context but 
but but I generally feel that it's looking outwards is how I how I feel better is when I'm just not yeah. thinking about all of that stuff and I'm sort of doing something or yeah you know. yeah and you know for people watching this there's uh, you know we're, we'll be coming up in new year's resolutions now I mentioned earlier don't wait for new year's resolutions you know at any time of day is the right time to to just begin in, in little steps but could you give some guide points in terms of somebody who does have dreams or goals or whatever, whatever you want to call them, the changes that they want to make, um, how to begin to draw them out of the kind of the, the cloud in our heads and, and make them a reality? What would, you know, would you get, have advice for people on that? Yeah, I mean, gosh. I mean, I, firstly, I'd say, like, I'm, I'm doing that too. You know, we all have dreams of how we want things to be. So what mm. I, I suppose my advice would be, to what I to, to give would just be how I do it for myself which is to try and firstly to really sort of imagine myself having already succeeded so let's say your dream is I don't know maybe it's to move jobs or or, or, or to change career in some way and you don't feel that it's possible mm. and you kind of lost you've got not got any motivation yet well I would suggest to like really envisage yourself already having got the job and doing it happily. So like, re and really bring that kind of vision to life. So, you know, the mm. office and what you're wearing and how you're doing the job and how it feels and that, just the act of doing that. But like, I mean it in a really sort of like intense way, like, so really imagine it, not just sort of as, as a throwaway thought, but as a, you know, really imagine it. So. I might do it on a run, for example. I might really get, get into my head and imagine the thing that it is that I want to be yeah. or do and really see myself doing it and get really detailed about that so so that the dream becomes something that you can actually see yourself in rather than a dream. It's actually happening in some version of reality in, in your mind. And I find that that is a really great, way to start that feeling of motivation coming is once you start mm. to really see yourself doing it like believe you you're, you're really really doing it and seeing yourself doing it then sometimes the sort of ne next step to doing it becomes clearer or becomes more doable you start think well actually mm. I, I i can really see it i can really see it so you know and then it is about the simple things of just taking the first small step so if it is a job thing you know, I mean, there's no way around it. The first small step is going to be doing the nitty gritty of, I don't know, CVs and all of that stuff. But yeah. imagining, so for, rather than starting with the small steps, imagining the end result first. And sometimes mm -hmm. imagining what the thing would be just before you got to the actual end. What would you be doing then just before you got it? And that way you can sometimes do it in a sort of backward way. And then the first step you really want to do because you've really seen the journey. Yeah. That, yeah. Maybe I haven't explained it, it, that very well. but No, no, it's, I, I absolutely, I completely relate to it. And it's, it, it really kind of is a kind of a form of self-hypnosis, isn't it? It's, yeah, it's, yes, it's kind yes. of, a, you know. Yeah. yeah. And, and the visualizations and, you know, when we're yeah. doing visualizations with people, you're getting them to kind of like, what are you wearing? How are you standing? Do you stand differently? So yeah. I think that's exactly what you're saying, it's isn't exactly it? You know, that. what are the senses? It's exactly really it's, getting it's, into exactly. it. Because, you know, as a coach, I know that there, well, I, I, I you know, it's the sort of CBT is that, mm. you know, you have your kind of, your thoughts will create your action the action that you take yeah. sorry your thoughts will you tend to take create the feelings that you have which will determine the action you take and mm. out of those three things the best thing that we can change are the thoughts that we have and the best way to change the thoughts that we have is to sort of artificially create a different experience that then generates these sort of different thoughts so the visualization creates a much different cascade of thoughts than i'm stuck i can't do anything I've got no motivation. Those are the thoughts you'll have, which generate feelings of n no motivation, inertia. And then the action is, guess yeah. what? Nothing. 
But once you yeah. do the visualization, you actually are creating a different set of thoughts. And once you master that, you will have different feelings, which will be feelings of a bit more powerful, a bit more excited, a bit more hopeful, which will yeah. create different actions. And there'll be much more kind of positive actions. So there's real yeah. science behind it. I think that CBT model, um, you know, that it's changing our thought processes is the most powerful kind of tool that we have. It's really difficult to do because we're, we're, we're thinking all the time and it's hard to sort of stop certain trains of thoughts. But I find I'm quite a visual person. So for me, the, you know, as you call it, visualization, you know, meditation, but with, with visuals and kind of manifesting it in your brain yeah. is, is for me and I enjoy that process anyway so it does create a different set of thoughts and that's very powerful yeah. if you can have have a different set of thoughts about your dream you'll 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 be much more likely to take action towards making it happen yeah and it's kind of happening to us anyway isn't it because we're it's already we're getting prompted by what we're wearing, who we're hanging around with, what we're, who we're spending our time with. I mean, I notice, for example, that, you know, in order to do a good clean of the house, I need the kind of baggy, rotten kind of tracksuit on and a pair of runners, and I'll do a much better job. I'll get in under stuff. I'll reach for stuff. I, go, I don't mind getting dirty or whatever it might be. You know, I just get going in into it. Whereas if I'm kind of like in work clothes, just quick dust, very light, something or other, a quick wipe or whatever, and that's about it. Kind of, you know, and yet I know also that, you know, there's the kind of manky tracksuit and there's the kind of nicer tracksuit. And, and again, how, you know, or how expandable the waistband is will, will affect me, you know. So yeah. I kind of think, yeah. would you agree? We're kind of always getting prompted by the environment without even realizing it. Oh, my goodness. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we have certain what you've just described is a really, you know, you know, that thought process and the cascade of yeah. if you wear the, this thing, therefore that job's going to get done. And what's really ha what's happening is, is that you're that neural pathway in your brain is really well trodden and it works and mm. it's a really good habit mm. because actually mm. what you've just described is a brilliant way of getting those shitty jobs done, which actually to yeah. one of your listeners, they might not have done that. I mean, I haven't either. And I'm thinking that's a really good technique. <laughs> I'm going to do that. <laughs> you know, I know that if I put my runners on in the morning, I'm going to go for that run. So so yeah. for you with that and, and and that's really important because those those pathways those connections that are happening in our brain generate mm. those action steps and for you maybe that's just a kind of it's 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 a habit that happens and you you know you don't even realize it's actually you know most a lot of people have to be really motivated to do that or think of being motivated but actually you've just yeah. done it because of you know if you put those clothes on you'll have those thoughts and you'll you'll get the job done yeah. Yeah. And it's the same because you were talking earlier about going out, you know, with friends and if you've kind of made that pre-commitment the night before. And really what we surround ourselves with and the people that we surround ourselves really matters, doesn't it? It really does. Uh, and it could be a book or something, but the voices that are coming and affecting us. Matter. Absolutely. But, you know, books aside, I think as women, you know, having a great group or you don't have to have a group, actually, just even one really good mm. woman. Um, not dissing the men at all but I find that that you know having and by good women I mean women that you know lift you up that have also invested in your dreams and believe in them with you and you know champion you that's that's mm. golden whereas if you're with people and obviously friends go through really tough times and sometimes you're spending a lot of time with 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 you know a best friend who's 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 suffering and so they're not in that kind of let's you know chase our dreams sort of vibe that's different but generally you know you need friends that 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 raise you up and you raise each other up and you're invested in each other's dreams and you're you know calling it forth all the time and checking in with each other you know the women that I go running with we're always checking in with you remembering the things that we we hope for and you know want to happen for each other and and mm. yeah, you know, champion e each other along the way because the daily grind, you know, it gets us all. It gets us all down. You need other people who've also got an eye on your dream, who are calling it forth in that way and helping. You know, yeah. you visualize it and make it happen. Yeah, I think it's. I I totally agree with, and I think it's really because a lot of times 
the people that we hang around with can be habitual or it's just situational. It's or you know, whoever is around us locally or our family or whatever it might be. And I think you sometimes have to get a little bit more proactive in terms of who you're listening to and who's around you. And it might be, you know, if you have dreams and or you're entrepreneurial or whatever it might be, you might need to kind of cherry yeah. pick who you're going to spend some time with or try and build a group Absolutely. little by little. Absolutely, Sana. And it's really hard because, you know, mm. you feel guilty if you're not, you know, if you've been really good friends with someone for ages, but you realize they're not really, serve, you're not serving each other in the way that you want. Alice, my business partner, has a brilliant um, kind of metaphor for it, which is a dartboard and that, you know, you're in the bullseye and, you know, be very careful who you choose to have in that bullseye bit with you. It's a very small space. You don't need many. Mm. And remember, you can always move someone from the bullseye to an outer ring for a bit. <laughs> They're not gone. Yeah. They're just not in yeah. your inner sanctum. They're not in your inner circle and move them. You know, people will come and go into your life as and when, but those that are not wanting what you want for yourself and wanting what's best for you are going to, you know, they're not going to help make it happen for you. And there yeah. are all sorts of reasons why people might not be invested in what you want, you know, and actually friendships change and evolve. And it doesn't mean that, you know, you've dumped each other, but you might rearrange things for different times of your life mm -hmm. and I think it is about kind of isn't it about getting more honest about what you want for yourself and making sure that everything around you kind of is pointing in that direction towards yeah. yourself and that you know um and being yeah just being kind of like kind of more honest about it and you talk about you you were presenting I can't remember after which book it was but you tell the story of having you were really nervous presenting to your you were asked to come into your publishing company oh uh, yeah and yeah. present and you had to say I'm really nervous yeah it was so weird because you know I'd been a criminal barrister for sort of 10 years and used to sort of doing jury speeches and and I couldn't understand the level of nerves that I had for just talking to this mm. small group at the publishing house. It was like off the scale. I was almost having a sort of full on panic attack on my way in. And I just mm. didn't know why it was happening or what was happening, really. So I thought that the way to deal with it was to just say it, I think, is what I said in the book, was because I yeah. can remember it. And I remember just, yeah, just being really honest and saying it. Um, I'm not sure I'd be so honest now. <laughs> Um, because, um I think, but there was something about the level of derangement I was feeling that I just thought it must be so obvious to everyone so I, I better just own it and say it and actually it was fine as soon as I said it yeah. I relaxed a bit because I think hiding stuff creates a lot more extra sort of tension stress shame all of those things which really inhibit us and if you show yeah. that any vulnerability immediately there's connection as soon as you show that you're frightened or you're nervous or and say it people you know respond to that because it's so human isn't it yeah I I couldn't agree more with you because I remember like I speak for a living and yet I remember one day well I remember one day standing up just being introduced something came over me whether I was just just that feeling of I actually just kind of want to be at home. I just felt vulnerable. I just didn't want to be on stage as it, as it were kind of thing. And I remember, you know, I remember that kind of explosion in my heart and anxiety is a horrible thing, but yeah. some of it is uh, part of it. If you, if you share it, then you kind of take the power out of it. I think, you know, because yes. you're it, part of it is like, do they know, do they know, do they, are they noticing or whatever, yes. you know? And, and I, another time I remember that was a long, long time ago, but I remember another time coming back after COVID. And I tell the story a lot because I, I just think it's, again, it's important to share for people. But coming back after COVID, definitely, I'd lost my mojo in terms of speaking, you know, in public because it's, it's so easy to speak behind a little screen, isn't it? And you kind of yeah. to stand up on a stage and da, da, da. Um, so I had to say, hi, good morning, everybody. I'm actually really nervous. And what happened afterwards was interesting because the CEO afterwards was thanking me, kind of said, Actually, I was nervous coming back too. This was their big oh, welcome back event, yeah. you know. And isn't it funny how we all just think everybody else is doing great? It's that Instagram life or the Instagram audience member, whatever. Yes, and actually, yes. 
Yes. It's that sharing of vulnerability. So true. And I mean, I've had lots of occasions when I haven't shared it and really regretted it because I felt sort of mm. too too shy or too anxious or it was too felt like too big a deal. But also I, what I was going to say was I, I feel like as we get old, as I get older, and perhaps also since becoming a mother, I definitely get more nervous than than I used to. Mm. And I don't know whether it's an age thing, mm. um, but that has definitely increased with age. Even there's something about getting older and you amass more experience. And yet, for me, I feel like I know even less. The, the more I know, the less, you know, it's that sort of mm. stripping away of, you know, any kind of sense of sureness about anything, which I'm sure is a good thing because it's it's that knowing that really you have such a short time on earth and we don't really know very much at all. And whereas when you're young, there's that confidence and of thinking you know stuff. Yeah. That goes, doesn't it, as you get older. But not yeah. in a not in a negative way or in a sort of, oh, I don't know what I'm talking about way, but in a there's a humility to that knowing that, wow, I really don't know anything at all. <laughs> yeah. Um it makes me nervous. <laughs> I totally. I, I'm. I'm hoping we can call it wisdom. Yes, <laughs> but yes, you know, the word, that's the word. Yeah, <laughs> let's call it wisdom. It's more flattering. <laughs> but I, I agree with you. Uh, you know, I think. Uh, I think we kind of feel that oh, this you know these kind of like uh, descriptions of success are kind of like you know as if it's kind of like a straight up line kind of thing, and maybe it's actually about become realizing that the world isn't just a predictable straight graph kind of thing and, and being more comfortable with actually realizing there's things unknown and they're mm. quite exciting things that are unknown. Yes, yes. And then just trying to manage mm. that, those nerves or anxiety by, by firstly, def well, whenever one can, just owning up to it is, one, is a great way of diffusing it. Um, yeah. and various self-regulation techniques. I mean, I do a lot of kind of breath work and stuff now <laughs> if I'm really nervous. Okay. Um, right, okay, interesting. Do you, do you feel that you are kind of, is there a kind of a softening in the, do you find in your writing there's a softening in your voice or there's a kind of a, is that, do you feel that that's coming through in your writing? Definitely. I mean, when, if you read the new book, The Heartbreak Hotel, it's definitely a lot softer. But it's 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 also it's still got the humor. But yes, I mean, I love those Grit Doctor books, and I love that energy that I had in that iteration of myself that was, you know, in my yeah. early thirties. It's you know we're diff you're a different person then, um, mm. and there's there was a real confidence and a no nonsense and a sort of directness that. I still have, but not probably as much. You know, there are different, mm. different um, voices, I suppose, that I have now. And there's a softening of a lot of, uh, there's a softening of a lot of stuff. But then, you know, the running thing has st stayed with me, that kind of no nonsense, get up and do it with the running, because it will really help. Um, yeah. But yes, I mean, that there's a sort of softening of, you know, a, a, a sense that life has been really hard for lots of people and things that perhaps I didn't take quite as much into account before I feel like I, I do now. I mean, COVID made me yeah. soft, um, I think, you know, just sort of right. felt so humbled by it, by being, you know, lucky enough not to have a family member that died and lucky, you know, sort of lucky to have a house and a garden and all these things that so many people didn't have um mm. and you know just that made me feel a lot more vulnerable I think than I yeah. had done maybe yeah. um and great I think sort yeah of, I think you know things like even but, my parents who I am grateful for but <laughs> but I'm often complaining about but you know in COVID I suddenly felt a sort of softness towards them that I hadn't yeah. felt in a long time. Yeah, 
Yeah. And I love you. You mentioned your dad's advice. Everyone is faking it to a certain extent kind of thing, which is kind yeah. of, I kind yeah. of like that, um, yeah. you know, just to realize. And that's why I think people relate to vulnerability and realize, oh, great, I can let that guard go kind of thing. You know, I think that's great. And the yeah. other thing that I, I, I want to come to that gratitude piece in just a moment. But I do love the um when you when you talked about uh, feng shui the, the hell out of all your house and your life, I, that. I just love that phrase. It's fantastic. Uh, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely love it. Yeah. <laughs> it really made me laugh out loud. But you mentioned there, and I think COVID has put manners on a lot of us. It, it kind of there mm. just to realise this virus is so tiny and yet at the same time so much bigger than us and so that there are bigger forces that, than ourselves uh, some that we know and understand and some that we don't and mm. uh, you ought in 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 your book and in your writing you you do bring in your own religious beliefs into um into this uh, and you've got you know you've got some really lovely quotes from saint john of the cross and and that so that kind of thing. So could you tell me a little bit about how, how or if it does impact your, your working life? Is it something, you know, are you religious and spiritual? Do you see a difference between the two or what's, how do you see that part of your life? Yeah. I mean, I definitely feel um, spiritual and religious. Um, and I feel that they are, that, I mean, for me, I'm a Catholic, I'm a practicing Catholic, I've raised our sons as Catholic, but I'm married to an atheist. Um, so, you know, I think I practice my Catholicism because it's what I'm used to. And I was raised as a Catholic and I love the rituals around being a Catholic. I like going to mass. I like that change of mindset that happens when I go into a place of worship and kneel down mm. and listen to these old stories. And, you know, there's something about that for me that really takes me to a place of spirituality that I I can't find it in another in any other way I mean it happens to me when I'm praying which I also often do when I'm running so mm -hmm. a run for me is a kind of prayer um and always has been like a prayer of thanks that I can run is is also I'm flooded with this huge sense of gratitude that I I can run it feels like such a gift okay. and I stay and, in that just for place. a lot of people listening and watching will kind of think generally speaking think of prayer as something we say it's the our father in, in the Catholic yeah. tradition or whatever yeah. it might be is that what you mean that you're speaking or do you mean it yeah yeah non-verbally no no I am I, in during the run I am giving thanks I mean to God mm -hmm. or, or what I, I don't even think of it really as a God thing it's more of a giving thanks for the for being able to run because of the gift of being a, of of having run the gift of that in my life is so immense to me so yeah. it's a kind of prayer that I am actually saying a prayer while while I'm running but to me the actual run itself is a kind of prayer I don't really know what I mean by that now that I've said it I think I mean that that um I don't know it's like a celebration of your body and your mind and it all working and that that is a gift mm -hmm. you know it's a gift that isn't yeah. that not everybody has yeah. so and do you struggle I mean so so many people have left um organized religion yeah do you find that you know do you think it's okay if people are kind of a la carte about it if they pick and choose do you find no I kind of what 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 is it to you do you have an image of god or that you don't mind sharing or not or is it a more abstract feeling or i think 100 i love you? that phrase a la carte about religion i've never heard that but i think that's okay. exactly what people should be if, if if they choose to be religious and i'm so i certainly am i mean i can't bear some of the, the catholic teachings about you know homosexuality or you know mm. the othering of it is just complete i i just I believe that if Jesus, you know, the Jesus that I love from the stories in the Bible would just laugh at all of that. He just wouldn't. I mean, yeah. he was a man that wanted the most othered people to sit with, the, to sit with them, hmm. 
that is that is not a man who would other anyone. He would have all the trans yeah. people, all the gay people, or, or you know, like, because he had the prostitutes and the tax. You know, th so to me, that that's something that's got gone gone wrong by the powers that be along the way. That's got nothing to do mm -hmm. with um, a Jesus or God, as I see them. If indeed I yeah. see them, I just um, I don't really think about it that much. I just like the idea of there being a sort of I like what I like about believing in something is it gives you this a sense of hope, this hope, hope as a sort of choice again, rather than as a as a, you know, living in hope is living with ideas that are bigger than oneself or. And I, I love yeah. that. I love that idea. The idea of it is it, I, I love, but it doesn't mean that I think that it's real necessarily or, or the truth. I don't trouble myself with that. I just like that when I practice going to mass, it brings something more to my week and to my relationships and to the love that I have for my family. It it just makes my life feel better, you know, and mm -hmm. it makes me try harder, I think. Um, yeah. And I just, yeah, yeah I just I, I just like the peace and quiet of it sometimes, to be honest, Susanna. <laughs> An hour of yeah. quiet away. <laughs> yeah. I tend to take I one twin each week because it's my special time with one of them and I can only persuade them to go once every other week so, um, <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's quite a good deal yeah. just two of us in silence yeah. for an hour it's the only time we're ever quiet so yeah and that that's just it isn't it Even, I mean and I know people who kind of said well I don't know I'm not Catholic at all or I don't believe at all but sometimes I go into the church just to sit um, and other people will kind of, oh, no, because it represents this, that and the other. But I've heard people who just go to sit because there's something in in it bringing you those kind of spaces, bringing you somewhere else. And we were talking earlier before we started recording about, um, you know, that, that it can bring you to a place that I use it sometimes to just bring you into me a different mode of mind is all I can say, just a different way of looking at the world. Mm. Um, because I, I, I do think, you know, and I, I don't know if you find this, but sometimes people will kind of say, how could you believe in this or that or agree with this or condone this? And you kind of go, none of it, none of the above that, mm. you know, that you do pick and choose and still it's OK, perhaps to stay mm. with a, a faith yeah. and to just kind of going, well, it's yeah, some of the things. And I just think, you know, me. we can't judge, you know, judging each other for. Our, all of that stuff is just so damaging you know let people be mm. you know whatever faith or not faith or you know it's all to me it's just it's all the same thing anyway um but also mm. you know I just think spending time judging other people for their choices around their religion is just well do something else with your time because actually mm -hmm. these things are very nuanced and complex and everyone's just trying their best to um, and, you know, it's not my responsibility, nor is it the next person's responsibility that, you know, some priests have done wrong. That's that that's got that's not on me. <laughs> um, yeah. And yeah. Um, yeah. I for it as much as the next person. Um, but, you know, there are still some beautiful things about for me about being a Catholic. And but 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 if I was born an atheist or a Jew or a Muslim or whatever whatever it is I'm there'd be beautiful things about that too I mean yeah. I'm not I think atheism is a comp more complicated because I think there's a sort of it's difficult to talk to someone I mean my husband's an atheist so I can say this and I love him obviously yeah. but there's a mm -hmm. there's a sort of it's almost like you're we're speaking such a different language because yeah. the atheist is adamantly against all organized religion and is mm -hmm. all about disproving the existence of but proof and existence of it uh, have nothing to do with faith so that yeah so that that that's that's more complicated but other than atheists who again i'm married to one my business partner's one so it's not yeah. like i have a problem with it but i think yeah. that that's the sl slightly more, more complicated position to argue with I think everything else is broadly the same. It's just, you know, we're all trying in our own ways to access our spiritual selves because we all feel, I think, something um, 
that yeah. that that the, the inside of us a sort of calling forth of ourselves or whatever that is that needs mm-hmm. that needs nurturing that needs watering um in order to thrive yeah i so agree and it is something and it is so experiential that you you can't come bring it back down into words because it is kind of wordless it's it's a it's a yeah. feeling isn't it so i mean there's yeah, a wonderful totally book agree. um that i read a long time ago now but is it called the case for god and i i remember the name of the writer but she was a she I can see it. Karen Armstrong. It's on my bookshelf. She was, yes, I think she was yeah. a nun and then she became mm-hmm. an atheist and then she became a nun again or something like that. But it's mm-hmm. all about the roots of, you know, it's the history of of the Catholic faith. But it's also about these words, belief, faith, practice, and that that where they come from. And it, it really has nothing to do with the things that a lot of particularly atheists think it has to do with. <laughs> nothing to yeah, do with it. it's literally just she actually it. talks about <laughs> she's amazing she's written so okay. much and she's you know you a hugely a hugely intelligent and academic woman but she's um she because she actually I, I i know what you're talking about because she mentions um that the word credo which we now we 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 translate does this ring a bell with you yeah. that she, we translate it now as i believe and she said it's i engage with and that would just change everything <laughs> change everything wouldn't it yeah i know i mean i think susanna like we were saying there's something so alienating and othering about the language of religion all Mm. religions have this problem and if only there was a way of making language itself around belief faith spirituality more inclusive and whole it would change so much for people because it's the language is so problematic or people's understanding of the language. Yeah. It is. Yeah. It can really bring up borders and boundaries between yes. us. Isn't that yes. right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, Ruth, you mentioned uh, a little while ago, your, your business partner, Alice Hatton. Yes. And now you're in a new venture together or maybe perhaps the venture isn't new, but you've got a new book coming out on, on yes. the 1st of February. And you have, um, you know, a whole series of workshops going on. Can you tell us a little bit more about those? Yes, yes. So we run um, retreats, both residential retreats for three to four days and day retreats in London for heartbroken women, um, mainly around romantic betrayal. And um, the book that comes out in February is 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 an attempt to recreate that experience of the retreats, the full retreats, for the reader. So the reader is invited into the Heartbreak Hotel book as mm-hmm. if they were going on the journey of the retreat with with five other guests in the book, and they all experience it together. So the reader will be doing the exercises with the other guests in the book. Um, okay. So it's quite unusual. Um, we hope in a really good way. <laughs> it's written a, yeah. partly as a play, um, so that it really does feel as if it's happening. Um, and we're really excited about it. We are particularly excited because it's a way of democratizing our full retreat offering, which is, of course, they're very expensive to put on retreats. Not everyone. Mm-hmm is going to be able to afford to come. We can only help eight to 10 women at a time on the full retreat. We only run for mm-hmm. a year. We want to help all women. So the book is one way of doing that. And these day retreats also can be for 20 women, which is great and a lot cheaper. We're hoping to soon to maybe take them on the road. We could definitely come to Ireland to, to do a few workshops. Um, we talk about and, that. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's yeah. wonderful. I mean, Alice is an experienced and absolutely phenomenal psychologist. So she came up with this mm-hmm. incredible idea and the process mm-hmm. that we take these women through. And I kind of co-facilitate it with her. I'm a coach by training for for the for, for our business venture, but also, you know, she's an introvert, I'm an extrovert. On the retreats, you need that yin and yang. You know, I'm in charge of the sort of hospitality side, taking people for walks, making sure they're okay in between these very powerful therapeutic sessions that Alice leads. So mm-hmm. it's been an incredible mm-hmm. journey. We only started in 
November 2021. Um, so we were very lucky that an agent, a book agent came on the first retreat, hence why the book has happened so quickly. So that felt like a miracle to me. An atheist mm -hmm. miracle, as Alice and I call them together, laughing. <laughs> when There's something in that. That was meant to be. However way you look at it, that was meant I'm to joking. be. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> and the, what kind of, what you know, for the three and four day uh, retreats, what are kind of, the, if, if you could just tell us even just what kind of experiences have women been through that, that come to you, whether it's for the one day retreat or the, the, yeah. the three or four day retreat? I mean, sadly, a lot of the experiences are very similar, which, which I mean, the, the day retreat is very specifically, and the main retreat has been more, more often than not around betrayal. So the name of the retreat is Moving Beyond Betrayal. But so the women come with these absolutely heartbreaking stories of having been left often completely out of the blue. They didn't see it coming which is also incredibly common by, you know, very, very long term partners, uh, you know, in long marriages or long relationships, often with children. You know, we had a woman come in her 70s who, you know, been married for, 50, you know, nearly 50 years and just didn't see it coming um, mm -hmm. to be left. Um, but also we have young ones who who come who, you know, we had had a few who you know, jilted at the altar type scenarios um, or just before. And actually, we had one very young woman come from Austria on one of the full retreats. And she'd been in a six month relationship, but she was absolutely devastated by it because of the same thing of not seeing it coming and not understanding why it happened. And that's what unites everyone is this mm -hmm. devastation around the life that they thought they were going to have with this person having been taken from them and then not understanding why and so they're often caught in this very difficult loop of obsessive rumination that's really hard to break out of but Alice has a brilliant set of techniques to help break that cycle because what the rumination is really doing is it's the brain's way of preventing you facing what sits underneath it which is the loss which is you've been left because you're not mm -hmm. loved and you've been rejected the rumination which is the why did it happen and I don't understand because this 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 is the brain's way of stopping you fit sitting in that the pain of what's actually mm -hmm. happened mm -hmm. and unfortunately you have to get it stay in that place of the the awful truth of it in order to be able to move to the next stage of the of the process so the first yeah. day of the retreat is really getting getting our guests clear on that and in the day retreat because they all come with this that's the thing that unites everyone is this incredible sort of this rumination i mean this obsessive rumination that that's really hard to break out of yeah yeah and as you say it's, it, it, as we were speaking earlier it's it's almost well, different to 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 a bereavement in that it feels done to you actively and ongoingly done yeah. to you, and that it's yeah, it's a rejection. You know, it's a, it's, a, yeah. it's an active, yeah. ongoing rejection, coupled with often a choice to be living the life that you were living with your with another person. Yeah, which is just you know that yeah. that is devastating to yeah. have to kind Absolutely. of keep being you know subjected to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the book is called Finding Yourself at the Heartbreak Hotel. Yes. And it's launched globally, almost um, well, well, as in yeah, well, 1st of February. 1st of February, UK, US, Canada um, by HarperCollins. And then in translation in Germany and the Netherlands and Italy and Poland and a few. Um, can't remember I think that's everything everywhere so far yeah. um, so far uh, so far yeah and before everybody calls in and says that's not fully globally I'm sorry <laughs> I know there's other parts of the globally world I know not. the world is really big I'm no, sorry no. for saying that but it's pretty it's pretty out there <laughs> I think yeah, let's yeah, say it's, well, it's well, available I definitely earlier, I'm manifesting it as global so I have to keep calling it global in order for it to become global <laughs> 
<laughs> it's pretty global. It's pretty global, let's be honest. Uh, <laughs> just um, all right. And listen, one last and final question. If, if I could ask, I ask all, all guests for if you could give somebody a tweak, as it what we call it, just a, a little bit of advice for, say, the week to come in getting going in whatever way, in whatever way they might want to, to make a little bit of what I call personal progress. What might you suggest? Well, I mean, I was thinking about this in the context of, you know, spiritual growth. Um, hmm. When I was thinking about about it for, for, for this recording, and I was thinking that one of the things that I do so regularly that really helps me is spending time like saying saying a prayer. And if if the prayer was simply what we discussed earlier, which is a sort of man visualization manifestation of that, you know, goal and seeing yourself doing mm. it but making time to do that it's the thing of making real time to do it mm. so that would be my tweet would be every day set aside you know five minutes to get yourself really really visualizing and manifesting where it is you want to be in and envision and envisioning yourself doing it and praying for it not praying to god or but you know making it like a prayer is can a prayer be a non-religious yeah. thing I don't I don't know yeah um but I, I think, think it can yeah you know because there's in prayer you're sort of willing something to happen by praying for it mm. you're asking for it you're asking God mm. or the universe whatever but you're that's kind of making it happen you're trying to make it happen by calling upon something to help make it happen even if that yeah. self, you know, if that calling upon is really your yourself, it's all the same thing. It's trying to make it a little yeah. bit more real and a little bit more alive rather than something that's yeah. just a fantasy. Yes. Kind of aligning all your resources. Yeah. Uh, whatever, and whoever they might run. be. But... <laughs> and, and go for a run. Or okay. walk. Or walk. <laughs> That's oh, that's it. That's it. Ruth, I can't thank you enough. That has been so fascinating to speak with you. Oh, and I've enjoyed it so it, much. Thank you for being with us. I hugely, hugely appreciate you being here. I was so inspired by your books. Um, but there is, I, I think there is a new, a, a kind of a new softness and wisdom in your work as you continue, isn't there? So um, I'm really looking forward to the next one and I will certainly be be ordering it if I can. So everybody uh, watch out for that book coming out on the 1st of February. And we can put uh, details in the show notes as well, just to remind everybody and about the, your workshops. Uh, if we'll get we'll get some information on that as well, because I think people would uh, might just there might be quite a lot of of interest here, too. Uh, uh, and um, and where, wherever people People might be watching and listening from so ruth a thousand thanks for being with us take care we'll see you again next week for next week's episode and until then take care of yourself and each other bye bye